My fellow YouTube enthusiasts, it has been the greatest honor of my life to serve you as a content creator for the last year and a half, and I am confident that our best days are still to come. If you would like to support the channel directly, please consider signing up to the Patreon where you will get occasional bonuses and early access to feature videos. Except for this coming month of November 2021, where you'll get sweet f**k all. Please find an explanation for why that is in the pinned comment of this video. In the meantime, don't forget to follow on socials, enjoy the video, and God bless you one and all. Hillary Clinton, there are three electoral votes at stake in Alaska. Let's take a look at the Electoral College map right now, where it stands. Donald Trump is ahead. He has 244 electoral votes to Hillary Clinton's 215 electoral votes. You need 270 to be elected president of the United States. Trump is getting closer and closer and closer in this improbable run, very impressive run for Donald Trump. Uh, John, so let's take a look uh, and see where we stand in these remaining states. From an Electoral College perspective, at least two out of three of these need to change uh, for Hillary Clinton to have a hope. Uh, probably all three of them. Uh, you know, we still got some business to do out in the western part of the country. There, these, some of these states aren't completely called yet, but the two big ones, Pennsylvania and Michigan, if they don't change, math doesn't work. He's got 240. There's a good chance you watched what you're seeing here in real time back when it was actually happening. If not on CNN, then another network or your web browser. Though after the fact, a lot of people will tell you they saw it coming. The truth is, at the time, it came as a shock to just about everyone. There are a few who vocally and consistently predicted it without making a serious hedge, but they're in a very small club. The election of Donald Trump was, by any reasonable measure, a gigantic upset. One that led to much despair and gloating as well as an intensification of the bitterness in the modern American political divide. In the immediate wake of Trump's victory, the question at the forefront of many people's minds was the same one that follows any shocking turn of events. How did this happen? There is no one simple answer to that question, especially when considering just how easily things could have gone the other way. To illustrate that, Let's take a quick look at the 2016 Electoral College. If you're not familiar with the Electoral College system, the simplest way to understand it is that there are effectively 50 separate elections in each American state. Each state has a set amount of electoral votes proportional to their population. Whoever wins a state gets all of their electoral votes. A candidate needs 270 electoral votes to win. Now at a glance, Trump's victory looks very decisive, which it is, based solely on points on the board. It's when you look a little more closely, up here, at the nation's rust belt, that you begin to see just how much of a squeaker this election was in reality. The states of Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin were seen by many as swing states in name only. States where Democrats had a moderate lead, but a very consistent and reliable one. The last time any of them had turned red was 1988, which is why the Clinton campaign regarded them as somewhat of a lifeline. In a worst case scenario, where Trump ran the tables on them in every competitive state, which he just about did, she would still win if she just held on to those three light blue states that were all polling in her favor. So how many votes did she lose them by? 44,292 votes in Pennsylvania, with a total of 6,165,478 votes cast. 10,704 votes in Michigan, with a total of 4,824,542 votes cast. And 22,748 votes in Wisconsin, with a total of 2,976,150 votes cast. That means Hillary Clinton would have become president if out of 13,966,170 people, she had convinced just 77,744 more people than she did that she was the best option. About half a percent. That's the sort of improvement in performance it would have taken to turn what's now seen as a crushing defeat into a historical victory. When the margins are that thin, and you ask the question, 
how did this happen? Just about any answer becomes somewhat plausible. Could Hillary Clinton be president if she hadn't taken the blue wall for granted and made just a few more campaign stops in those three states? Could Hillary Clinton be president if she had uttered one less comment that could be interpreted as disparaging Trump-leaning voters? You could put half of Trump supporters into what I call the basket of deplorables. <laughs> right? The racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic, you name it. Could Hillary Clinton be president if she had made just a little more effort to placate supporters of her primary opponent, Bernie Sanders, slightly lowering complacency among progressive would-be voters? Could Hillary Clinton be president if some guy didn't really enjoy sending strange women pictures of his wang? Before we begin to unpack the seemingly unquenchable thirst for self-destruction that is the real subject of today's video, it's worth taking a little time to explain why a lot of people used to really like Anthony Weiner. Although to be clear, a lot of people always really didn't. The Democratic congressman from New York was unabashedly left-wing, which never caused him any problems in his district, but certainly made him a prime target for the ire of conservative pundits, politicians, and interest groups. That was never a concern for Anthony Weiner, though, as he was always game for a fight. It's Republicans wrapping their arms around Republicans rather than doing the right thing on behalf of the heroes. It is a shame! A shame! If you believe this is a bad idea to provide health care, then vote no! But don't give me the cowardly view that, oh, if it was a different procedure, the gentleman will observe regular order and sit down. I will not. The gentleman will sit. The gentleman is correct in sitting. And it was that combative instinct and style that won him a place in the heart of the nation's progressives. In a world that offered countless buttoned-down politicians with oily grins and overly rehearsed talking points, Wiener had an unusually pugnacious approach that to some may have come across as belligerent and unpleasant, but struck others as a refreshing instance of a politician who really believed in what they were selling. What this is really about is that we took a plan that is basically founded on free market principles and said, you know what? The employer-based model, we're going to try to have more people get employer-based insurance. But if you're really honest and consistent, this is the moment in the bill that I would hope my Republican colleagues come down five minutes at a time and say, let's get rid of that dastardly federal employees health benefit plan that the legislative branch benefits from. Or at least come down and say, I'm taking it and here's why I'm contradicting what I said in the campaign. And aside from his fighting spirit, Wiener exhibited a somewhat off-color sense of humor for a politician. Well, I, I haven't said I'm going to vote for it. Okay. Okay, but I you don't... You can make some news right I, now. I don't... Did you just touch my knee? I think I, I enjoyed I that. See, <laughs> this is... That's why Gretchen left. <laughs> Nothing crazy, but just off-color enough to break the mold of yet another political hack from DC. Similarly, he often exhibited a level of sarcasm and sneer that most politicians would make a conscious effort to pull back on for fear of being unlikable. What he said in that sure tape is that he believes in liberty and his wife believes in liberty. And what's happened in the past is other justices have come out and made speeches. I mean, we've had justices like of the press speeches. pushing I, I know on you like giving, I know you like giving speeches, but you're doing an interview. I got 20 so seconds against a heartbreak. Go ahead. What's the question? Well, you, you, you I heard the speech. Right, What's forget your question? It. I gotta go, Congressman. Thank you so much for coming on. All Great the best interview. To you. Aces. <laughs> Thanks so much. A lovable wise guy to some, a condescending asshole to others. What side of that fence you fall on doesn't really matter. The point is, Wiener's ability to inspire such polarizing feelings was a mark of his greatest asset. Unlike so many of his peers, he actually came across like a real human being. Even if you don't like him at all, you should be able to see why others were glad to have him on their side. But from May 27th of 2011, all of that rapidly began to change. Wiener was a rather prolific user of Twitter and one of the most followed members of Congress. 
using the website to tweet barbs at his adversaries and interact with his supporters. Those interactions were by and large innocuous, but on that fateful May evening, a tweet emanated from his account linking to an image that was a little more risque than a run-of-the-mill selfie. <whistles> the picture, a close-up of a man's boxer briefs concealing a large bulge, was addressed to the account of a 21-year-old female college student from Seattle. It was deleted very shortly thereafter, presumably after the sender realised it was not private, but not before one of Anthony Weiner's many political adversaries was able to grab a screen cap and forward it to a right-wing media commentator who, while being an ideological opposite, very much shared Weiner's gloves-off approach to political battles. That commentator was a man by the name of Andrew Breitbart, a conservative firebrand as well as somewhat of a pioneer of partisan online news media, having had a hand in founding not only the eponymous Breitbart.com on the right, but also the Huffington Post on the left. Breitbart's media ideal was not one wherein everyone was fair and impartial. He regarded such an objective to be impossible. Instead, he advocated for a media culture wherein every publication and network was nakedly biased, making no bones about what team they were on. And whatever else you may think about Andrew Breitbart and his vision, there's no doubt he led by example. Within 24 hours of the Liberal Congressman's questionable social media postings deletion, a screen cap of the now infamous bulge was posted on Breitbart's website, Big Journalism. Not long after that, mainstream media outlets began to pick up the story. When it comes to crisis management and political scandals, one of the first decisions you need to make is how much are you going to admit? It's easy to prescribe the approach of come clean early and get ahead of the story, but when you're the one actually facing the prospect of having your career ruined, it must be very tempting to step back for a moment and ask yourself, what are the odds of me successfully burying this thing? Can I convince enough people that these allegations are false, or to at least be in two minds about the situation, so that I can move forward without ever having to take ownership of the embarrassment? Attempting this is a very risky play and seldom successful, but a successful sweep under the rug can be pulled off on occasion if circumstances are ideal. Anthony Weiner's circumstances, however, were that the bulge photo was confirmed as being sent from his personal account to one very specific woman before being hastily deleted. The sort of behaviour you would expect from an account being operated by the owner trying to cover up their activity, as opposed to say a hacker trying to inflict as much damage as possible before the security breach was rectified. As we've said, Wiener was known to have a lot of fight in him, but was he really going to try to spin this? This seems like it was a prank to make fun of my name, you know, when you're named Wiener, that happens a lot. Got 45,000 some odd Twitter followers, hundreds of people that I follow. Uh, this seems like a prank that has gotten an enormous amount of attention. This is the picture. Uh, I'm sure you've seen it by now. Is this you? I can tell you this. We have a firm that we've hired to, I've seen it. It's, I've seen it. Um, we're a firm that we've hired to try to get to the bottom of it. I can tell you this, that photos can be manipulated. Photos can be of one thing changed to look like something else. We're going to try to get to the bottom of what happened. Maybe John Stewart last night had it right, unfortunately. I would feel terrible if this was true, as, as a friend of his. And I do have my doubts about its uh, veracity. <laughs> Having nothing to do with the circumstantial back and forth that seems to be going on about it, my doubts stem from this. Uh, no way. No f***ing way. <laughs> Seriously. No way. No way. In real life, my memory is this cat had a lot more Anthony and a lot less Wiener. This is not, this is not what I remember. I'll be honest with you, the only thing that Anthony Wiener and this uh, gentleman here uh, appear to have in common is uh, that they both lean hard to the extreme left. Boom! <laughs> Boom! Seriously, I mean, his <laughs> just not that big. It can't be. <laughs> we just want to resolve it once and for all. You would know if the, 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 this is your underpants, for example. The question is, this, uh, I appreciate you continuing to flash that at me. Um, uh, look, 
I, I've said the best I can that we're going to try to get to the bottom of, of what happened here. But, you know, I just want to caution you, and you understand this, you're a pro, that photographs can be manipulated, photographs can be taken out from one place and put in another place, photos can be doctored. Um, and I want to make sure that, that, that we know for sure what, what happened here. It certainly doesn't look familiar to me. But I don't want to say with certitude to you something that I don't know to be the certain truth. But I do know some certain truths here. I didn't send any uh, Twitter picture. The person who allegedly it was sent to, this poor woman who was frankly a victim in all this, um, didn't get it. She put out a statement saying as much. What Wiener has just said about the recipient of the bulge picture is completely true. And this is one of the few instances in the entire saga where he got lucky. The woman in question, Jeanette Cordova, did not have time to see the message before its deletion, and was alerted to its existence via the ensuing blow-up on Twitter. Because all of the commotion was coming from her and Wiener's political adversaries, and because she and the congressman had not engaged in any suggestive messaging prior to him sending the image, she initially brought into the notion that the incident was most likely orchestrated as part of a plot to embarrass Wiener, and issued a statement to the press saying as much. I don't consider it that big a federal offense, but people want to pay attention to it, and I guess I, I, I get it. When you're named Wiener, it kind of goes with the territory. Have you ever taken a picture like this of yourself? I can tell you this, that there are, I have photographs. I don't know what photographs are out there in the world of me. I don't know what things have been manipulated and doctored. At the risk of stating the obvious, Wiener's approach of remaining agnostic on whether a close-up of a man's crotch depicts a crotch belonging to him is bizarre. It's also an indicator he has likely not consulted with any public relations experts or Washington spin doctors on how he should handle the situation. Denial is one thing, but once you've made the decision to go down that path, you need to quickly establish the most effective parameters for that denial. The two most effective options in this case would be either A. Total denial as in, I never sent that photo, it is not of me, someone else took it and then hacked into my account to send it. Or, if you don't think you can get away with that, option B, partial admission. That photo is of me, and I did take it. It's very embarrassing, but it's private, and I did nothing wrong. Clearly someone hacked into my computer or phone, found that image, and sent it out. Wiener's approach of neither affirming or denying the authenticity of the photo itself is the worst of both worlds, as he now needs to try to make the notion that he did not send it believable, at the same time as presenting an objectively unbelievable notion that he does not know a picture of his own crotch when he sees one. So the question is, have you asked Capitol Hill Police or New York Police or FBI or any law enforcement authority have I to called, investigate? Have I called the cops or the FBI because someone sent spam? No. However, I did get a, a firm, a law firm who specializes in these things, who specializes in white collar crime. I've got someone who is, and they're going to get someone who's an internet security expert to try to get to the bottom of how we secure my accounts. Every day, Wolf, people have stuff like this happen. It's regrettable, but it's true every day. Every day, it doesn't become a federal case. Just because it happened to Congressman Weiner on his personal account doesn't mean that the taxpayer should pay for some big investigation of this that winds up going on and on for years to find out who, wait for it, who sent a picture of someone in shorts on the internet on the account of a guy named Weiner. I just don't think it rises to that level. I don't think it's a federal case, but I'm going to turn it over to some people who are going to give me advice on what to do next. Had, but uh, have your lawyers suggested to you that a crime may have been con uh, committed if somebody broke into your Twitter account Perhaps. and but sent That's one out? of the things. It's a fair question. Because you're what, a United States congressman. I know, but I'm a citizen, too, and I'm, a, and I'm a guy who's on Twitter jousting with people all the time. I follow you, by the way. Excellent Twitter feed. Uh, I, I have to say that it doesn't necessarily mean that because it happened to Anthony Weiner, means it should become a big federal investigation. I've watched federal investigations go on for years and chew up millions and millions of dollars. For what? Because someone sent a picture to someone who never even got it, who says they don't even know me? I mean, I understand people may be curious about this particular case, but at home there are people who are watching this saying, you know what, I get spam all the time, I don't call the cops. Or you know what, I mean, it's a, it's a terrible thing that happened, but I lost thousands of dollars in a hacking and I couldn't get a federal investigation. Why should Congressman Weiner get one just to find out who sent a Randy picture from his, uh, from his Twitter feed? We now know why Weiner really didn't want official investigators looking into whether the incident may have been the result of a hack, though it wasn't particularly hard to guess at the time.
It is of course difficult to walk the line between I've been the victim of a security breach and I have no desire for anyone outside of a private firm accountable only to me to look into this breach. As unconvincing as Wiener's reasoning that everyday people aren't afforded the luxury of FBI involvement for these sorts of matters may be, you have to give him credit for pure nerve. It requires a certain amount of moxie to take an issue like unsolicited dick pics and apply a populist spin to it. Back on March 13th, a woman named Ginger Lee, who's a stripper apparently, she tweeted this, and I'll, I'll put it up on the screen. You know it's a good day when you wake up to a DM, a direct message, from at rep Wiener. I'm a fangirl, y'all. He's my trifecta of win. Do you have any idea who this woman is? Were you I, another sending person, her direct messages? This is another person who I has gotten dragged into this for no reason other than she was following me and asked to be followed by me. Uh, she was following and asked to be followed. It's, I think what this is about is a fairly pro forma thing that goes out that I send out to people as I follow them. Thank you for following me. Please check in at anthonyweiner.com. But honestly, Dwolf, just take a step back and listen to where we are now. You're now going back to my Twitter feed and other people who aren't even me, not a congressman, someone who didn't sign up for this, someone who said at their tweet about a congressman, and now you're asking me to explain why they did that. Where do you, in your mind, does this investigation or this story, at what point does someone say, you know what, we've kind of jumped the shark here. This has gotten a little bit crazy. I don't know who the woman is. I followed her for a moment. And then someone started tweeting, oh my goodness, Anthony Weiner's following um, someone in that industry, and I immediately, not wanting to cause trouble for her. Did you send her a direct me. message? I, uh, most likely what she's referring to is as a pro forma thing, thank you for following Congressman Anthony, thank you for following me, please stay tuned to anthonyweiner.com for updates on other things going on. That's probably what she's referring to. That was not what she was referring to. Later, Ginger Lee, an adult film performer, would state that Anthony Weiner sent her messages of an explicit nature, often referring to his quote, package, but never included any pictures, and that she did not reciprocate with suggestive messages herself. She also revealed that she contacted Weiner after the scandal broke, asking how to respond to media inquiries, and he asked her to lie about their communications, assuring her the story would die down. Are you protecting anyone? Yes. Who? I'm protecting my wife, who every day is waking up to these insane stories that are getting so far from reality. You know, we've been married less than a year. Um, to watch her watch these stories get crazier and crazier about what is essentially a prank, a hoax. You know, we knew we went to bed that night not batting an eye. This, this was a goofy thing that happened. I know your wife, Uma. She's a, she's a great lady, she and, and you're this. and you're a very lucky guy to be married I to sure her. Am. She works for the Secretary of State, has for a long time. Uh, how's she handling all this? Well, she's bemused. You know, she's got some experience, and she's not a public person, as you know. I mean, she went the entire campaign in 2008 with probably most Americans not knowing that she was the traveling chief of staff to to, to Hillary Clinton. Um, she's a remarkable, remarkable woman. I'm, I, as my friend Heath Schuler once said about her, you know, I've I've outkicked my coverage. She married a congressman, okay? She knows a little something about living in public life. She knows with that goes a certain amount of, you know, aggravation. I don't think she imagined that it would be this. These bizarre stories about people who are connected to me by eight or nine rings of connection uh, on, on social media. I'm protecting her the best I can. Um, I can handle myself. These poor people who are getting dragged into this with these more and more bizarre conspiracy theories. I'm protecting people who, who who are so offended when CNN puts this Breitbart guy on and says the most outlandish thing about complete innocent people. It will likely come as no surprise that that Breitbart guy had not had his final say on this whole salacious affair. Angered by the insinuation of some bloggers that not only may the tweet have been the result of a hack, but that Andrew Breitbart may have been the one behind it, he posted several more pictures on big journalism on June 6th that had been provided to him by an anonymous young woman. Unlike the bold shot, Wiener's face was clearly identifiable in this new collection of photos. Breitbart also claimed he was in possession of another photo that was quote, extremely graphic, and left nothing to the imagination.
It was presumably this development that led Wiener to conclude he was out of options, and he announced he would be holding a press conference at 4pm that very same day. But reporters who were gathered waiting for the congressman to have his say on the latest revelations were in store for a surprise when a very different figure took the podium ahead of Wiener's arrival. I'm here coincidentally, I just arrived at LaGuardia because of media requests and as I got into my hotel, I'm Andrew Breitbart by the way, um, we reported this at big government and uh, big journalism and I'm here coincidentally, I did not know that they were going to be announcing this, so I'm just staying at a hotel about three blocks away so I just decided to come by and see what he had to say. I certainly did not like that. Uh, he doubled down on the, this is about Breitbart uh, problem. I mean, if he's going to come up here and take some form of culpability here, he was party to a campaign for 72 hours that weekend to allow for the left-wing blogosphere, including the Daily Cost, to accuse me of being the hacker. Why is there no accountability for an entire weekend of false reporting that was based upon what I believe was Congressman Weiner's strategy to blame the messenger? Do you think Wiener should resign? I don't, I don't have an opinion on that. That's uh, for, for uh, him to decide and, and his constituency and the Democratic leadership. Shortly after Breitbart wrapped his impromptu appearance, it was finally time for Wiener to have his say. At the outset, I'd like to make it clear that I have made terrible mistakes that have hurt the people I care about the most, and I'm deeply sorry. I have not been honest with myself, my family, my constituents, my friends, and supporters, and the media. Last Friday night, I tweeted a photograph of myself that I intended to send as a direct message as part of a joke to a woman in Seattle. Once I realized I had posted it to Twitter, I panicked. I took it down and said that I had been hacked. I then continued with that story to stick to that story, which was a hugely regrettable mistake. This woman was unwittingly dragged into this and bears absolutely no responsibility. I'm deeply sorry for the pain this has caused my wife, Huma, and our family, and my constituents, my friends, supporters, and staff. In addition, over the past few years, I have engaged in several inappropriate conversations conducted over Twitter, Facebook, email, and occasionally on the phone with women I have met online. I've exchanged messages and photos of an explicit nature with about six women over the last three years. For the most part, these, relations, these communications took place before my marriage, though some have sadly took place after. To be clear, I have never met any of these women or had physical relationships at any time. I am deeply regretted, regretting what I have done, and I am not resigning. I have made it clear that I accept responsibility for this, and people who draw conclusions about me are free to do so. I've worked for the people of my district for 13 years and in politics for 20 years, and I hope that they see fit to see this in the light that it is, which is a deeply regrettable mistake. I believe that everyone deserves an apology here, and I certainly am, I'm, 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 I'm certain, I'll be, here's what, where's your wife right now? I apologize to Andrew Breitbart, I apologize to the many other members of the media that I misled. I apologize first and foremost to my to my wife and to my family. Where is she right now? Where is she right now? She is not here. Wiener's decision to not resign after being confirmed to have sent graphic texts and pictures to multiple women, often unsolicited, as well as brazenly lying about it for several days straight, was yet another bold move. But his hopes of holding on to his seat in Congress were not quite as delusional as they might now seem in hindsight. In the direct wake of his admission, polling found 56% of his constituents agreed he should stay put. This was not the only factor in play, of course. Many of his colleagues felt the embarrassment was hurting the wider Democratic Party and their ability to effectively pursue their legislative agenda and called for him to step down. In the age of the 24-hour news cycle, however, there is something to be said for the strategy of holding on for dear life. It seemed Wiener's core base of supporters still liked him and were willing to forgive him. Feelings outside that core base were far more sour, but time has a way of smoothing these things out. Inevitably, someone else will have a scandal, 
Another event will spark a heated national debate. A natural disaster will occupy the airwaves, and in six months, the sexting habits of Anthony Weiner might be a dirty footnote in his political career. A source of many wisecracks and a lot of giggling, but not the death knell of his time as a public servant. An optimistic forecast for the months ahead, to be sure, but crazier things have happened. The main thing Anthony Weiner had to rely on for that sort of scenario to come to fruition was that the damage that was done remained the damage that was done. He could possibly pull through this just so long as things didn't get worse. If I were to title this, and I'm like a photo editor at the AP,、mm-hmm. and I needed to come up with a title for it, I would call it Two Balls One Shaft J- Dot JPG. <laughs> Two、okay. Balls One Shaft. Dot- Two Balls One Shaft Dot JPG. Right. Yeah. Yeah.、Uh, from from the undercarriage perspective. And is he fully、uh, aroused in this、uh, photo?、Oh. He's an excited chap.、Uh, an excited <laughs> chap. Yeah.、Uh, yeah. And, and, and and I'm just talking.、Uh, I think he's the most heterosexual guy out there. Okay,、mm-hmm. he really is, but he's definitely reading all the magazines that give him the tips that will cause the men、uh, to to go, "Whoa, this is my kind of guy." I'm talking this guy、uh, unless he has that hair disease where you don't have hair. Oh my god, that's that's the famous. That's the real one. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's a really his. Yeah, he sent that. Andrew Breitbart had said that as far as the extremely graphic photo that left nothing to the imagination was concerned, he would not publish it so long as Weiner ceased aiding in the perception that he may have been involved in a hack of Weiner's Twitter account. And Breitbart himself actually made good on that promise. He did, however, make the mistake of putting any confidence in New York shock jocks. As co-host of the Opie and Anthony show, Anthony Cumia would explain the following evening. Breitbart says that、uh, the picture was released without his permission. You agree with that, right? Yeah, I'll agree it was released without his、uh, permission. But、uh, you know, when you take a chunk of meat into a lion's den, someone's gonna take a bite.、Uh, the Opie and Anthony Show, not quite known for its newsworthiness,、uh, known for its underhandedness. The picture was shown. We did ask to see it、uh, for for proof that it was actually、uh, that it, it existed. And、um, uh, somehow, I think eight thousand cameras went off、uh, when the, when this、uh, picture was shown, and it did make its way to、uh, to Twitter. And then Gorka sends pixelation shortly thereafter. Technically, there was no new revelation here. The photo was already known to have existed. But with these things, there's a difference between existing as a conception and actually being out there in all of their literal naked glory. Whether or not that leak really was the deciding factor in Anthony Weiner's hopes of survival cannot be said with certainty, but there's no doubt it contributed to keeping up the story's momentum and the mounting pressure from his fellow Democrats to resign. With even President Barack Obama going on record as favoring that course of action, and so on June 16th, it was time for the congressman to hold yet another press conference. I had hoped to be able to continue the work that the citizens of my district. Elected me to do, to fight for the middle class and those struggling to make it. Unfortunately, the distraction that I have created has made that impossible. So today, I am announcing my resignation from Congress. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So my colleagues can get back to work. As far as scandalous exits from office go, it's hard to get any more humiliating than Anthony Weiner's. And not only was it a spectacle. But a new kind of spectacle, one that truly reflected our digital age, a sex scandal without an actual mistress or even physical contact. With most subjects, this would be about the right note to begin wrapping up on as we go over lessons learned. The story of Anthony Weiner is so bizarre, however, that his resignation from Congress only marks the end of the first act. We haven't even gotten to the weird part yet. So what was next for Anthony Weiner? I've been fighting for the middle class and those struggling to make it my entire life, and I hope I get a second chance to work for you. And I've got some ideas on how to do it. Sixty-four of them, right on my website. Take a look. Tell me what you think. 
We love this city, and no one will work harder to make it better than Anthony. I will fight for you every single day. Thank you for watching. He ran for mayor of New York City just two years and change after his shameful resignation from a significantly lower position. And we still haven't gotten to the weird part yet. Anthony Weiner is rising in the polls in this year's wide open New York City mayoral race. A recent Marist poll shows him surging to the top of the Democratic field, taking a quarter of the vote to New York City Council Speaker Christine Quinn's 20 percent. And so began one of the quickest rehabilitations in American politics. In April, a contrite wiener posed with his wife, Huma Abedin, on the cover of the New York Times magazine. So far in the campaign, wiener's past transgressions haven't been much of an issue. Look, I made some big mistakes, and I know I let a lot of people down, but I've also learned some tough lessons. It was a jaw-dropping comeback story on the surface, but when you reflect on it a little, perhaps it shouldn't have come as a surprise. As we mentioned, it was the people of New York who were most open to forgiveness from the outset, so it stands to reason that Anthony Weiner's political prospects would be at their most favorable with Washington DC out of the equation. And from all appearances on the ground, this was no polling error, because whenever an opponent tried to use Weiner's sexting past against him. I want to say one thing about American values. I would contrast my values with Anthony Weiner's values the response was resounding. Voters were sick of hearing about it, much as that may have frustrated those wanting to capitalize on Wiener's personal failings. I said, <laughs> keep your hands to yourself. I heard what you Don't said. Put your hands on me really? Ever again. And what's going to happen if I do? You're a tough guy now. Yeah. Oh, are you now? I am. You know, I can defend myself. You can. Yeah. You can. Okay, good. Maybe get your anger issues under control. I don't have any anger issues. I think you do, Grandpa. And perhaps New Yorkers were showing more wisdom than moral disregard. Wiener's scandal was gross, but if someone who's done a job that you've approved of for years upon years upon years does something gross, wouldn't it be somewhat callous to not give them a second chance? For a time, this story looked like not just a remarkable comeback, but also a sort of unorthodox fairy tale ending or at least next chapter in politics. A story that began with smut, that was followed by lies and looked to end in ruin, but then turned around on account of grace. A collective generosity of spirit that understood a good man need not be defined by his worst moment. For a time, that's what it looked like this story could be, until the people of New York, along with the rest of the world, learned. Two years after a tawdry sexting scandal chased him from Congress, Anthony Weiner is begging for forgiveness again. Turns out he continues sending lewd messages and photos to at least one woman even after he was forced to resign from Congress. He did it again! <laughs> so two years ago, this photo caused a scandal that cost him his political career and just as his political career was being resurrected, this new photo is threatening to kill it all again. Deal with it. You just saw that. This time, there are some awesome developments, and here is the most incredible one. New allegations that he kept on sexting under the alias Carlos Danger. <laughs> yes. You heard right. He called himself Carlos Danger. Anthony Weiner's alter ego is a Bolivian action hero slash porn star. <laughs> Danger is my username. And almost as if to live up to the reputation of that daring username, Weiner made the decision to stay in the race. The damage control approach he took to his second scandal was one of minimization that you'll see him outline here at his press conference following the new revelation. We'll use his opening statements to clarify what his core justification is, as well as, again at the risk of stating the painfully obvious, explain why it's laughably ineffective. I have said that other texts and photos were likely to come out, and today they have. Some of these things happened before my resignation, some of them happened 
after, but the fact is that that was also the time that my wife and I were working through some things in our marriage. So Wiener's pitch is this. He acknowledged at the time of his announcement of a mural run that the pictures that came out before his resignation from Congress were not all that was out there. This is true. However, up until this point, he never disclosed that other pictures that were out there had been taken and sent after he resigned, which is, of course, absolutely paramount. Just to put an extra fine point on it, look at this clip from his first 2011 press conference. I brought pain to people I care about the most, and the people who believed in me. And for that, I'm deeply sorry. I apologize to my wife and our family, as well as to our friends and supporters. I'm deeply ashamed of my terrible judgment and actions. It's one thing to watch a man whimpering in shame in front of an entire nation as a result of taking pictures of his penis and sending them to strange women on the internet, but to know that after having to issue that humiliating apology, as well as step down from his job, that same man went on to take yet more pictures of his penis and send them to yet more strange women on the internet. Well, it's the difference between bad judgment and abject masochism. And how Anthony Weiner and his wife Huma Aberdeen, two by all accounts intelligent people, thought there was even an outside chance this problem could be surmountable, remains one of modern American politics' great mysteries. The core minimizing factor Weiner puts forward is that while these incidents did take place after his resignation, it was during a time that he and his wife weren't sure they were going to pull through. This is a complete non-starter, because if your marriage is on the brink of collapse due to strains that stem from sending strange women pictures of your penis on the internet, that is only more reason to refrain from sending more strange women pictures of your penis on the internet. I'm glad these things are behind us. I know that this was a very public thing that we had happen to us, um, but by no means does it change the fundamentals of my, my feelings here, and that is that I uh, want to bring my vision to the people of the city of New York. I hope they're willing to still continue to give me a second chance, and I hope they realize that in many ways um, what happened today was something that frankly had happened before, but it doesn't represent all that much that is new. So when, when, did you drop out? Actually stop? when was the last explicit text from Um I can't, I, I can't say exactly. Uh, sometime last summer, I think. Was it after you told People Magazine, quote, or your wife told People Magazine, it took us a lot of work to get where we are today, and we're trying to be the best husband we can be? Yes. After that? Yes. There are mounting what, calls for you to drop out of the race. What do you say to those people who want you to drop out of the race? I'm sure many of my opponents would like me to drop out of the race. We're trying to move forward, and we are recognized it's not going to be easy. We knew at the moment we got into this race that it wasn't going to be easy, but I believe this is an important thing to be doing. Thank you all very much. Why should we trust your judgment? And from that point, Anthony Weiner's media appearances only continued to get more and more hostile. I have uh, a just really just one basic question for you that I think a lot of people have wondered about for, for different reasons uh, over the course of the campaign. For me, it just comes down to this, which is... What is wrong with you? A tactic politicians often deploy in interviews is answering the question they want to be asked. For example, Governor, what do you have to say to the accusation your funding cuts to infrastructure are to blame for the bridge's collapse? Well, first of all, let me say that my thoughts and prayers are with all of the loved ones of those motorists that perished during this morning's rush hour. And... While we all grieve, we must also honor the victims' memories by looking ahead, which is why my administration is unveiling plans for a new bridge that will serve not just as a monument to this great state's engineering know-how, but also as a tribute to the lives we lost on this fateful day. The trick is to appear to be gearing up to answer the question asked without actually explicitly acknowledging it before smoothly transitioning into the thing you actually want to talk about. You're about to watch Wiener perform the maneuver in about as clumsy a way as one could. What is wrong with you? I don't understand the question. What is wrong with me that I care so much about the issues that I fight for every day, that I have my entire career? 
There are three mistakes in that five second answer. First Wiener acknowledges the presence of the unwanted question, then he reiterates it, and then he issues his reframing answer in the form of a question, handing the control of the conversation back to host Lawrence O'Donnell. What is wrong with you? I don't understand the question. What is wrong with me that I care so much about the issues that I fight for every day that I have my entire career? No. What I mean is this. What is wrong with you that you cannot seem to imagine a life without elective office? That's ridiculous. Uh, of course I can. I, I don't know. Are, are, are you saying that, that because I have things in my personal life that are embarrassing, I shouldn't run for office? Okay, that's, that's no. a fair position me, to have some people Let me have be it. clear. No, I'm not. Let well, me you're be not very clear. So let's work a little harder I'm going to be very clear to you. I'm going to be very clear to you now. I have never once criticized you in any way for anything involving your texting. I think your photography is just perfectly uh, standard American photography that's floating around the internet now. I don't have any, I've never said anything about that. What I find strange about your campaign is what seems to be your absolute desperate need for elective office and what seems to be your inability to live outside of it. What did you do, for example, with your time away from elective office? Did you find any problem anywhere in the world that you thought, I think I'd like to apply myself to that and try to help some people who might need my help? You didn't do that. You just set yourself up for running for elective office again. Question. I don't what care about your question. phony do an political interview answers. Here. Do an interview. You, are being, you are being driven by some kind of demons in some what strange kind of, directions. They, and Lawrence, I'm wondering do you want to ask me a question or do you have me on a harangue with a split screen? This can't be good TV for anybody. All right, you know what, Anthony? We got about twenty seconds left. So here's what, I, here's what I, no, here's what I'd like to do. I would like you to stay. Give me ten of them. Stay. I'd like you to stay, if you will. And we'll continue this online, and you can and you can online. say whatever you want. Online, get harangued online. Nobody watches the show. You, Who do you think's online? You can say whatever you want online if you All want right, to continue buddy. this. All right, buddy. It's been it's been it's been great doing a split screen harangue with you, Lawrence. At some point, you ever want me to respond to you? You let me know. The question is, Anthony, what is wrong with you? That's what I want to respond okay, to. Okay, I heard the question, and I said, well, what do you mean? Because I, I desperately right, care about the issues of the men. We'll find out if Anthony Weiner sticks around yeah. to, to do this yeah, online. Anthony Weiner, you'll get the last word <laughs> Thank online you. if you want it, Anthony. Good night, Lawrence. <laughs> When going over how his 2011 scandal unfolded, we mentioned that one of the ways in which Anthony Weiner got lucky was that the women he involved in his communications were not particularly publicity hungry and consequentially did not significantly exacerbate his crisis. He was not so fortunate in 2013. The woman at the center of the latest Anthony Weiner sexting scandal is Sydney Leathers, who also identifies herself online as Sydney Elaine XO. So how did she meet Anthony Weiner? Lou Cola Giovanni is a friend of Leathers. She initially contacted him through Twitter. She was a fan. She said he was. A, she said that she was a fan. Um, I assume that based on how beautiful of a young lady that Sydney is, Anthony Weiner had no choice but to. Uh, act on his instincts. Sydney loved him, but then she fell out of love with him because the idealized vision in which she had of him was not true and not the case. Cola Giovanni says the conversations quickly turned from politics to sex. This was the result. Dozens and dozens of sexually explicit text messages and photographs, including images of his anatomy that are simply too explicit to show here. Their online relationship continued for quite a while. It's been reported in some outlets that this, this may have been going on for six months. I think it's more accurate to say it's been going on for eight or nine, um, maybe even possibly a year. Sydney Leather is now 23. Her friend says she never slept with Anthony Weiner or took any money from him, but that he did offer to help her get an apartment in Chicago and suggested he visit her. At one point, she told the website thedirty.com that Weiner asked her, quote, do me a solid and hard delete all our chats. So, Randy, I know you're in Indiana. You didn't find her. Any idea where she, where she might be? 
Well, Wolf, the guy we spoke with for our story today, the guy we interviewed, said that Sydney Leathers is hoping to make some money by selling all this dirt that she has on Anthony Weiner. So it's very likely that she's far from here somewhere peddling that story of hers. He told us that she has hired an agent who told her that she could make as much as $100,000 for selling her story. And indeed, it wasn't long until Sydney Leathers was herself in New York City doing talk shows, news programs, photo shoots, and just generally ensuring that Anthony Weiner's scandal-ridden trudge toward the Merrill Race's finish line was dragged out in as undignified a manner as possible, culminating in an absolute spectacle on election night. On September 10th, Weiner predictably finished at an abysmal fifth place in the Democratic primary, with just south of 5% of the vote. He chose a modest venue to deliver his concession speech, an Irish pub named Connolly's in Midtown Manhattan. Sydney Leathers, who had never met Weiner in person, camped outside the entrance to the bar, along with various members of the press, planning to force the former Merrill hopeful into a public confrontation. Word of Leathers' plan got to Weiner before his arrival. Upon arriving, he and some close aides raced into a McDonald's that was adjacent to a stairway leading to a rear entrance of Connolly's. Leathers spotted them and was soon in hot pursuit, but the Wiener campaign had gotten too much of a head start. Hold on, hold on, have we lost her? Seriously? All to avoid a 23-year-old, really? And so he was ultimately able to deliver his concession speech without incident. There are some moments that really make you wonder what must be going through a person's head? And watching Anthony Weiner, who just a few years ago was a highly regarded congressman, and mere months ago, a serious contender for mayor of perhaps the world's most iconic city, as he's chased by a 23-year-old former sexting partner through a McDonald's, is one of those moments. One wonders if in that moment, he might have been asking himself the same question Lawrence O'Donnell posed. What? is wrong with me? It's a question he may not know the real answer to, and one we can only speculate on. O'Donnell posited a pathological drive to hold political office that causes him to be delusional about how realistic his prospects are. That's a decent enough theory. And of course, there are alternatives to consider. Could it be that something as simple as just a stone-cold addiction to sexting was the real root cause for his behaviour? Something he knew could be career-ending, but for which he had such a compulsion that he simply could not stop. Quite possibly, that's it. But what if it goes a little deeper and darker than that? What if Weiner was driven not just in spite of, but actually by the prospect of humiliation and ruin? There might be a clue right there in his username. Danger. It isn't so uncommon for people to get off on the prospect of a negative outcome in a sexual context. The prospect of being caught is said to be what many people find thrilling about sex in a public place, something about a third of Americans have done in their lifetime. So when trying to wrap your head around why an otherwise intelligent man would do something as dangerous as sending lewd messages to a person knowing that all that needs to happen for his world to be turned upside down is that person forwarding that message onto a member of the press, well, Maybe that in and of itself is the answer to why he did it. That extreme risk of doom, rather than being a deterrent, is the motivating factor. It's just a thought, one to keep in the back of your mind as you watch what happens next. The biggest victim in all of this, if you don't count Wiener's son, who wasn't old enough to understand what was happening at the time, was of course his wife. It can't be said since the first scandal that this situation had been entirely thrust upon her. She did know about the later incidents when she signed off on and participated in her husband's run for mayor. But regardless, as you watch Huma Aberdeen's big dark eyes often stare off into an abyss of abject humiliation during her brief appearances in the documentary that chronicled that campaign, it's very hard to feel anything but profound sympathy for the woman. But in a strange way, the complete unequivocal end to any prospect her husband had of ever holding political office in the future may have been a blessing in disguise for Homer. With Anthony now permanently out of the spotlight of politics, only appearing publicly on occasion to sit on a talk show panel, that in turn meant less attention on her, allowing her to apply all of her energy 
to what was always her real calling, working behind the scenes for another public servant, one she had been devoted to for years. <laughs> Let's look to the future with courage and confidence. Let's build a better tomorrow for our beloved children and our beloved country. And when we do, America will be greater than ever. Thank you, and may God bless you and the United States of America. Huma Aberdeen had been a trusted aide of Hillary Rodham Clinton since the 90s, when she worked a stint as an intern in her office while she was serving as First Lady. Not long after that, she was an advisor on her campaign for the US Senate in 2000, then her travelling chief of staff during her presidential run in 2008, then her deputy chief of staff during her time as secretary of state, and then in 2015 she took on the role of vice chairperson for Clinton's second presidential campaign. You might think a high-profile politician like Hillary Clinton would want to distance themselves as much as possible from something like the Wiener Spectacle. But competence, coupled with unfailing loyalty, can be a difficult combination to find in this business. And besides, it may be that Hillary Clinton is, shall we say, more averse than the average person to the notion of punishing a woman for the sins of her husband. Having a high up role in any presidential campaign is needless to say, beyond a full time job. But this is even more the case if the election year is 2016 and your boss is Hillary Clinton. Fun fact, at the time of Clinton's run, 52% of the population had a negative opinion of her, the second highest unfavorability rating for a major party candidate in the history of the United States. The number one spot belongs to one Donald J. Trump, with a whopping 61%. The reasons for Clinton's divisiveness are too numerous to go into here. There is, however, one that we need to explore a little in order to properly illustrate how this whole shit show comes together in the end. And that is her damn emails. A quick disclaimer, chances are a lot of you will have strong feelings about this, i.e. it is one of the biggest nothing burgers in political history that needlessly weighed down the campaign of an eminently qualified candidate, or it is every bit the demonstration of what duplicitous operators the Clintons are that the detractors make it out to be, and the apologetics around it just speak to what chumps their supporters are. There's a saying in politics, often attributed to Republican strategist Lee Atwater, Perception is reality. When it comes to running for public office, it really doesn't matter whether any allegation or idea about you is true or not. If something negative and also false about you takes hold, the consequences for you will be precisely the same as if the negative thing were true. Now we're not saying the criticisms of Clinton in this area aren't valid, nor are we saying they are. What we're saying is, it doesn't matter. All that does matter is the perception. So here's the 101s of Hillary Clinton's email woes. During her time as Secretary of State in the Obama administration, she conducted all of her business through a private email as opposed to an email issued by the State Department. This was problematic for a number of reasons such as that a private email may be more susceptible to hacking, compromising the security of sensitive and confidential information, and correspondence through private accounts are less readily subject to mechanisms of disclosure such as freedom of information requests. Clinton was not the first official to conduct business through a private account, but the lengths that she seemed to have gone to to do so were exceptional. It wasn't just a matter of using a personal account on a platform like Gmail. Clinton had actually set up a physical server in her New York home that hosted the account. Sticking with Gmail as our example, if an official were to use that sort of account and there was some kind of investigation into them, the investigators could go and subpoena all the records from Google, because they're the party that has all the servers on which the information is stored. When the official is the one with the servers, however, well then they are the sole party you can go to to acquire the information you want. Not a great setup, unless you're happy to take it on faith that these sorts of officials would never try to hide anything, in which case we wouldn't really need investigators or transparency laws in the first place. 
The FBI investigated Clinton's use of a private email server and ultimately concluded that although her practices may have violated statutes regarding the handling of classified information, no reasonable prosecutor would bring such a case against her. In essence, they said that she shouldn't have conducted her business that way and doing so was stupid, but it would be a reach to call it criminal. One element of the controversy that was especially enduring, even after the FBI closed their investigation, was the deletion of tens of thousands of emails from Clinton's server. The Clinton camp's explanation for that is as follows. When the investigation was underway, they readily handed over every email they believed to be in any way work-related, somewhere in the range of 30,000 emails. This left another 30-odd thousand emails on the server that were deemed to be of a personal nature. When Clinton's people asked her what she wanted done with them, she said she had no use for them anymore, and they were subsequently deleted. No matter how you personally feel about this episode, just grant for argument's sake that Clinton's explanation for the 30,000 deleted emails was completely on the level. Again, the only thing that's really important to understand from her position as a presidential candidate is that that doesn't matter. Because even if her explanation and the findings of the FBI are believable, a significant amount of voters will never find time to properly consider them. Instead, they will consume the story through headlines and sound bites. The content of those headlines and sound bites? Private server, FBI, thousands of deleted emails, criminal investigation. So, is Hillary Clinton a crook? That's a question we don't have any interest in answering. What we can say, though, is that the email controversy had enough tidbits in it for people to get the perception that she was a crook. And if that was their perception, it may as well have been the reality. Fortunately for Clinton, there's another aspect of headlines and soundbites that very much worked in her favour. They move by lightning quick, especially in an election year. The FBI closed their investigation on July 5th of 2016, four months before Election Day. Not a long time at all in most contexts, but in the context of the 2016 news cycle, it may as well have been a lifetime. So many stories came out in the intervening time, many to the detriment of her opponent, that in the run-up to polls opening, Hillary's emails felt like an almost prehistoric talking point. Something die-hard opponents might still bang on about, but to the average swing voter, sort of felt like old news. As high as her negatives were, Trump's were higher. So long as she stayed on message and let her surrogates contrast whatever her shortcomings were with those of Trump, all forecasts indicated that the election was more or less in the bag. As much of a pain as those damn emails may have been, they weren't going to be a make-or-break issue unless something fell out of the sky to put them back at the forefront of everyone's minds. This morning, ABC News has confirmed that New York City's Administration for Children's Services is investigating Anthony Weiner and his care for his four-year-old son, Jared, after this photo became public. The lewd image sent to one of Weiner's alleged sexting partners and also showing the former congressman's son. Weiner allegedly even referring to the boy in a text message accompanying the picture, writing, someone just climbed into my bed. In another series of texts, Weiner allegedly describing his son as a, quote, chick magnet. After sending the photo of his son in the bed, Weiner momentarily started to panic, referring back to his previous scandals. In this exchange, the paper published, Ooh, I was scared. For half a second, I thought I posted something. Stop looking at my crotch, he sent. Whatever, you did it on purpose, she sent back. For Wiener, this was the third strike. Tonight, their marriage is over. After long and painful consideration and work on my marriage, I've made the decision to separate from my husband, Abedin said in a statement. Just when you think it can't get weirder, tonight a federal sexting investigation into Anthony Weiner leading to an October shocker, putting Hillary Clinton on the defensive. The FBI announcing that it's investigating newly discovered evidence related to her emails. The bizarre twist? It's all connected to the tawdry messages of a disgraced former congressman. The FBI discovered the new emails on a device shared by top Clinton aide Huma Abedin and her now estranged husband Anthony Weiner during their investigation into Weiner. 
intervenors alleged sexting with a 15-year-old girl. It's important to remember that Huma Abedin, Clinton's top aide, was another person who had an email on that private email server owned by Clinton. Had she been sending emails to her husband, Anthony Weiner, maybe those are emails that the FBI wants to look at. Who is Uma married to? One of the great sleazebags of our time. Anthony Weiner, did you know that? No, think of it. So Uma is getting classified secrets. She's married to Anthony Weiner, who's a perv. This is a new breed of October surprise. It comes from the FBI and it comes in the middle of voting. More than 18 million people have already cast, ba cast ballots. Millions more are doing so every day between now and Election Day itself. If uh, the former Congressman Anthony Weiner had access or was able to see some of these emails that were perhaps classified, uh, that may be a problem for Hillary Clinton. That would be a huge problem for Hillary Clinton because that would be the first instance here in this case where they would potentially have found someone mishandled classified information. I don't like Uma going home at night and telling Anthony Weiner all of these secrets, okay? The Anthony Weiner Huma Abedin piece, it's almost too weird for words. If in fact there are emails that emerge as part of the Anthony Weiner investigation that impact the presidential election, it's as if all of these storylines, all these political storylines come together into one combust combustible mess. So late tonight, just moments ago, FBI Director Comey sent a letter to all his employees saying that while he wouldn't ordinarily do this, he felt compelled because he'd recently testified repeatedly that this investigation was complete. He said, we don't know the significance of this newly discovered collection of emails. I don't want to create a misleading impression. But he also acknowledged that in the midst of this election cycle, there is a significant risk of being misunderstood. Tonight, Clinton doubling down in that press conference, practically demanding more information and appearing confident that it will not hurt her chances on November 8th. There is a consensus now that it certainly did hurt her chances. And indeed, since her loss, Clinton herself has said on record that FBI Director James Comey's decision to reopen the case is what she ultimately attributes to the shift in polling that took away her stronghold on the Electoral College. As with all counterfactuals, blaming James Comey is speculative. We can never know for sure what would have happened had he decided to keep the books closed, at least until after November. But when we're talking about less than 80,000 votes across three key states, if you are going to blame one person besides Clinton herself, it's hard to think of a more consequential individual than James Comey. Besides, perhaps, Anthony Weiner. But really, that's redundant. Because to blame James Comey is to blame Anthony Weiner. No underage sexting escapades, no federal investigation, no seizing of devices, no discovery of emails, no James Comey reopening the case. No, one could quite plausibly argue, President Donald Trump. A butterfly effect with dick pics. Just as when he was sprinting through that midtown McDonald's, one wonders what might have been going through Anthony Weiner's head that November evening as the results were coming in and those states were turning red. Because there's no way the potential causation was lost on him. Imagine being a progressive Democrat, watching your electoral nightmare unfold before your very eyes, with the knowledge that your sexual fetishes might have had a significant hand in manifesting that nightmare. Again, we can only speculate. We'll never know what Anthony Weiner was thinking at that moment. Maybe a part of him got off on it.